Today is taken from the 12th chapter of John, verses 20 through 33. context for it is Jesus is um, days away uh, from his death. He is in Jerusalem and uh, has, has come into Jerusalem. And so starting with verse 20, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But when I or rather, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we go into the word today. I have entitled it, motivation. (laughs) We live in a world that uh, has produced a number of motivational speakers. Uh, All you have to do is Google motivational speaker and there's this. We seem to be in need of motivation. If this person can just give it to me. And uh, have you ever, anyone ever gone to listen to a motivational speaker? Yeah. Usually works pretty well for about 24 to 48 hours, and then your life kind of goes back to where it was. And that can happen in, in, in um, spiritual uh, realms as well. You can go and have a revival and uh, come off of that revival or perhaps a retreat and come off of that retreat and just be all motivated and just give it a few days and, or a few weeks and somehow the motivation seems to, to dissipate. But today, as we look at the scriptures that we read, I want to really focus, if we can, on motivation. And as we do so, let's, let's take a moment and pray. Lord, you are the one who moves. You're the author and the origin of everything that motivates us. Your spirit moves, and while we may not be aware of the direction or the origin of where your spirit comes from, we do know that we can experience it and feel its momentum. So as we look into the scriptures today, we pray that you open up our eyes and ears, that we may be one and move according to your motivation, your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I have been fascinated by what motivates people. Why do people do what they do? It doesn't take um, all too much 
uh, mind thought to uh, figure out why my dog does what my dog does. She's hungry. She has to pee. She's tired. That's about it. There's not much more to that. My cat's much more complicated. I have no idea sometimes why my cat does what, what my cat does. But people, um, they're, they're a little bit more complicated, huh? Why do they do what they do? What makes someone tick? And as we're looking at motivation, and as Jesus ministered, the three years that he ministered, he, understanding human nature, was able to meet the various needs that many people sometimes are simply unaware that they have. Some of the needs we're very aware of, like food and shelter and things like that. That's a very powerful uh, motivator. I mean, last night we did this, this, this place was filled. Food, food. Next day, not so much. Motivation. Um, and, 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 and actually, in, <laughs> during Jesus' ministry, he even addressed that. If you remember, he went up on a mountainside and began to, to, to teach about the kingdom. And as the time passed, his disciples realized this group is going to get hungry and we don't have any food. You ever been around people that get hungry? They get what we call hangry. Irritable. So, he fed them with the uh, fish and the bread. And the following day, he had traveled ahead to the other side of the lake, and they looked all over for him. And when they finally found where he was, he immediately said, you know, you're looking for me because you ate food. I gave you some bread. And he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't judge them. He just, you know, put out the truth. You're looking for me not for spiritual truth, but because you had your fill of food. And, um, but I offer something greater than just that. To the woman at the well, when he was parched, remember that story? There's a woman at the well, and, and uh, he arrives at the well with his, di his, his students, his disciples, and they go off to to uh, run an errand and he's left alone with a woman and he asked her you know can you please get me something to, to drink from this well and they get into this conversation and in that conversation he says if you only knew who was talking to you he could give you living water not just water that you'll be thirsty again but water that you will never in other words I can meet your deepest need And then, of course, his disciples show up and they talk, talk, they encourage him to get something to eat. Rabbi, you haven't eaten anything. You need to eat something. And you remember his response? I have food to eat that you know nothing of. Um, what, Mountain Mike's pizza? They just put it in a new Chevy's or something? What is it that we're unaware of? This deeper need, um, in addition to the needs of the flesh, what motivates people? And if you take a look at the human needs, that's pretty, pretty basic. We need some sleep. Got to get some sleep. Didn't get as much as I like last night, but that's all right. You got to have some kind of uh, food and, and nourishment, clothing, etc. But there are deeper needs as well. There's a relational need and there are spiritual needs. And, and this is what Jesus um, addresses most profoundly. In fact, he says, if you seek these spiritual needs, everything else, seek ye first the kingdom, and everything else will fall into place. But he makes it a point of saying, you know, the Gentiles, the people, in other words, that don't know God, they're the ones that run after what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat. 
because they don't know God. And you don't have to be like that. Because if you know God and you seek the kingdom, all that will be taken care of. So you don't have to even concern yourself with that. have to be aware of it, but you don't have to worry about it or be concerned or feel responsible because God has that covered. But there's, there's a deeper need that Jesus was able not only to address, but to make people aware, a deep spiritual need. And the deepest need spiritually that only Jesus is able to meet is one, the deepest need to belong. The deepest need to belong. We have such an innate need to belong that God has designed us in a way that we spend more time, <clears throat> I think, than any other animal needing to be nurtured by our family and by our parents before we can go out on our own. It's a deep need for connection, an unbreakable connection. In part, it's why Jesus says, may they be one as we are one. That close, that tight. The need to belong is, is just, it, just, it goes to the core. And so the, the greatest fear we have is uh, rejection. That's why um, people fear, fear public speaking more than they do death when they did the surveys. Death was number two. Number one, public speaking. Now what is so hard? We talk all the time. Talk on the phone. Why is that terrifying? Because of the possibility of rejection. Nobody wants to be rejected. We need to belong. We are designed for that in the same way that we are designed for food. If we don't get it, we will try even... We'll, if you can't, in terms of the physical, if you can't find food that's nutritious, eventually your hunger will drive you to eat just about anything. And the same is true with that deep spiritual need to belong. If you can't find that need to belong in a healthy way, you'll try to get it any way you can. Before the New Testament, the very last prophetic book of the Bible is uh, an Italian prophet, Malachi. He's a good pizza man. A Malachi, I tell you a Jewza. <laughs> the Lord Almighty. That would be kind of funny, dude. Anyway, towards the end of that book, the very last chapter, he says, before the arrival of the Lord, my spirit will move among the people and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their sons and of the sons to their fathers. Otherwise, everything will just burn itself down. Paraphrase. The connection, the need to belong. Jesus Knowing his connection with his father was inseparable, was able to move with a certain sense of joy and confidence and vision from that relationship. You break that relationship and everything implodes. Recently, we've heard various things regarding uh, the shootings, uh, the shooting that recently took take place, and you would, if you're aware of the news, you probably have heard the discussion centering around some kind of arms control or some kind of gun control, right? That's pretty popular, and uh, mental health. But you probably have not, if you have, let me know. I haven't heard anything about the fact that every single shooter that has taken place has not had a father. Yeah, but you, it's not popular. Almost to a, an individual, 
every gang member that is in prison does not have a father. And the deepest need to belong then is met in this manner. Because the need, just because the person that's designed to meet the need is not meeting that need, doesn't mean that the need goes away. There's no accident that Jesus refers to his father as just that, father. Because we have a great need to belong. And in historically speaking, and yeah, I am going to get to the text in a second. Historically speaking, we have found if we can't get our sense of belonging in the kingdom, we find our sense of belonging other ways. One way is ethnicity. I'm German. I'm Norwegian and um, Swedish or whatever the case may be. And... Um, nationality and ethnicity is a way that we can find a sense of belonging. I tried to instill that in my son, but he just cannot take Lutefisk. It just... But son, it's your identity. It's our people. This is where I go to the Italian side, Dad. I'll go with the Italian sausage more than that stinky fish. But you know what? If you go to Minnesota, oh my God. Oh, the loot fister, my parents can't wait. They'll search them out. You know, they find, they, they got a map on their wall with pins where the, 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 the different loot fist dinners are. As an identity, we need a sense of belonging. Whether it's the Rotary Club, Elks, bowling, whatever the case may be, we need that. And Jesus understands that. And if we can't get that, then we'll sometimes, if we don't go with our ethnicity, we'll go with our nationality. If we don't go with our nationality, uh, we can go with other things uh, to try to get that need to belong. Political parties, and right now social justice issues are a way that people can belong. Let's just all get mad together and we'll be one. Yeah, we're one. And that's a way of belonging to something, at least. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. Ah, right. The Greeks don't belong. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We're Jews. And, you see, when, when your sense of belonging rests in human creation, human, not divine, but human creation. You will defend that created sense of belonging with all that you have. So you will defend your Jewishness against the Greeks. And when it relies upon human construction for your identity, you will fight for it with everything for your particular history, your culture, whatever the case may be as your sense of identity. And it's not their history. It's not their culture. Therefore, they don't belong to us. People get a sense of identity from their history. But that's not kingdom identity. That's worldly identity. And there is truth to that to an extent. But it's not the deepest sense of belonging. So the Greeks go up to worship and immediately, do you remember how in the Gospel of John, how Jesus starts his ministry after changing the water into wine? Because in the Gospel of John, he went up to Jerusalem three different times. And the first time that he went up there, he turned everything upside down. Remember that? Anyone remember that? You remember the Bible, right? And, and where do you get this authority to do this? And what he was doing is he was, he was deconstructing this setup in which this one area that was designed to give Gentiles, Greeks, a place to pray, they had turned it into a place of 
commerce. And so he was completely upset about it. He just flipped everything. This should be a house of prayer because we all belong here. That's why he ruined it because they had turned the worship of the living God into the worship of the temple. Religion does that. But our temple holds our history. Yes, but you worship God, not the temple. But the temple represents, the building represents all of what we stand for in terms of our culture, in terms of our, our history with God, in terms of the promises of God. It represents it all. And we've got to maintain the temple. Jesus says, you're not worshiping God, you see. God's the one that gave you the temple, not the temple, so that you can serve the temple. And so he's just upset and he just turned everything over so that everyone has the opportunity. See, religion in and of itself, when we find our sense of belonging spiritually, not in the kingdom, but in human constructs, it always leaves other people out. Always. Because not everyone's going to share our history. Greeks did not share Jews' history. They're not going to share in our rituals. Greeks did not share in the same rituals as Jews. But the unifying factor that brings all mankind together is Jesus. That's why he says towards the end of the verses, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Everyone will come to me regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your history, because, and this is key, I am the only one that can, that can meet that deepest, deepest, deepest need. Because in addition to having a need to belong, we also have a need for purpose. And we have a need for meaning. And only God can give us that as we surrender our lives to his kingdom, his purpose. And without that, we have such a deep sense of isolation that the common phrase written by the philosopher, most men live lives of quiet desperation. We're dead inside. Oh yeah, we'll pull the we'll pull the cart. No passion. Obligation, which is good. But no passion. A deep sense of meaning and purpose. And so we look for leaders to give it. You give us that. Give us a political leader that, that, that inspires me, that gives us a sense of purpose, that gives us a sense. And that's why they were so enamored with the idea of Jesus being that political figure. Finally, we're going to get somebody that can come in and make Israel what we know it can always be. Just, Lord, bring us this one person. And when that one person comes and doesn't fit in the human constructs in which they had identified him to fit in, they rejected him. Nah, this isn't going to work. Not at all. And this is the conflict that every single human being experiences as they follow Christ. Christ, as the spirit of Jesus dwells within us, it deconstructs what we have been led to believe that we belong to and gives us a greater vision. If you take a look at most churches, the ethnicity... The, by the way, Rancho Cordova is the third most diverse city, at least it was when I came here, in California. How diverse are we? And I'm not saying diversity, I'm not one of those social justice things. All of a sudden, diversity is not in and of itself all that exciting. So what? Kingdom of God diversity, that's, that's pretty cool because we all have the unity then, you see. And 
And so this, this, this deep need that Jesus gives to belong, people were flocking to him. People that have been rejected by conventional constructs of belonging. The sick, they don't belong. Those who have been mistreated, they don't belong. Those who are sinners, they don't belong. Uh, those that are Gentiles that don't share our history, they don't belong. No, none of them belong. And Jesus says, yes, everyone belongs to the Father because the Father has created everyone. And it's not only that real realization that Jesus gave to those people that felt that they did not belong, but it's also the proclamation of reality itself. Everyone belongs to God. And this deep wanting to belong to something, just something that can give me a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And it can't be, my motivation for getting out of bed can't be, I just have 10 more years to retire and then I can sit and do nothing. Thank God. Click, 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 click. Dang it, 800 channels ain't nothing good on TV. But that's what American culture has indoctrinated many people into believing that there's no greater purpose than to simply be comfortable. And if anything, the greater purpose drives us into a peace that passes all understanding, but drives us into the uncomfortable struggle between flesh and spirit. And the flesh, I'll tell you what, I, I give myself over to the flesh. Oh, I'm a good flesh guy. I'm a good, good, good flesh guy. I can sleep with the best of them. I can sleep in, I can give my life over to just food and drink and pleasure and all that kind of stuff. We all can. But the deeper purposeful things of God is what deep down is calls to each person. And if we can't get there, God, just give me a good movie to watch. Something that just, the drama. I, I need to see the, the drama because I'm not participating, you see. And so this, the, the Greeks that come to the feast, they don't get along with the Jews. And yet they're all drawn to this greater vision of belonging. Could you imagine just for a second? I've been here for 16 years. Rancho Cordova is now almost 74,000 people. We haven't grown once. Can you imagine, however, if God were to direct us in a way that that vision was so intoxicating that we would have to have three and four and five services. Can anyone imagine it? And if you can't, that's why it's not happening. It's there. It's right there. Folks, the field is everywhere. 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 The Greeks come, and now, because they, this, this construct, by the way, between Greeks and Jews and all that that we put up, they make it hard to get to Jesus. <laughs> so there's Greeks, they want to worship, they go to Philip, because Philip's from Galilee. He's, he's from the area where they come from. So they go to Philip because at least we have some history. You grew up in Galilee. I grew up in Gal Galilee. History is, a, is, is one way that you can get a good connection. I go to Device Brewery and I found out the guy that's giving me my beer grew up in Minnesota, Plymouth. And so every time I go in, hey, yeah, I talked to my friends from Plymouth. There's a little history there. It's not kingdom history, but it's a little history. They go to Philip because he shares that same history with them. And they said, you know, Philip, um, we like to see Jesus. Oh, boy. Let me go tell Andrew. Andrew, these guys want to go see Jesus. 
I know he's really busy. He's been teaching in the temple court. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. Let's go talk to the master. You know, let's, let's talk to him together. Okay. They make it, these constructs that we have make it really, really, really difficult for people to get to know Jesus. Oh, no, 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 you, you can get to Jesus, but you've got to learn to be a Jew first. This was the biggest obstacle in the first church. Yes, you can get to know Jesus, but first you're going to have to become like one of us. You're going to have to learn our history. You're going to have to learn how, what foods we eat. You're going to have to, if you're a guy, are you ready? Get circumcised. And that just cut, you know, enrollment down by... <laughs> You can come to grace, but you're going to have to, you know, okay, well, I'm out. I'm out of that. But the thing of it is, that's what we do. Well, oh, yeah, you, we'll, we'll teach you about God, but first you have to plow through this layer upon layer upon layer of rituals and customs and traditions and all that kind of stuff. And, and then you can get to Jesus. That's what the Jews did or tried to do with the Greeks. Jesus had to cut through all that and just go to them directly. And so when they finally get them and they, they, they tell Jesus about it, he stays focused on the, on the big picture here. I'll talk with him. This is, this is the context. But this is what the big picture is. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That's the truth. The worldly aspect of our nature, the worldly way in which we have been conditioned to think must die. We must surrender every aspect of our lives to this greater vision in seeking God, in seeking Jesus, and in so doing, you will find life. That's where the life will come in. And the seed of God is his spirit that he plants within us. And as that seed grows, aspects of us will have to die in order for that seed to produce its fruit. I was at, um, I shouldn't have done this. 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 But I was at the school in the cafeteria and we were talking at the table and I said, who at the table do you think is the best at math? Oh, this person, that person. Okay, who is the fastest runner? Who's the, fast, who's the best tetherball player? Oh, she's the best tetherball. Oh, cool. Who do you think at the table knows the most about the Bible? <gasps> This is the devil's foothold. You don't belong here. You go back to your little building. You don't come into our school. This is where the devil reigns. You're not allowed to use God's name here or even talk about him. We'll sue your butt. Scoot, get back to your little building. This is what the spiritual message is of the day. Oh, I think this person knows about it. My dad's a pastor. Did you know his dad's a pastor? No, I didn't know. Okay. Well, but what about you? I know. I, I think I know. I know the fruit of the Spirit. You do. Yeah, there's eight fruits of the Spirit. And also, we just had a natural conversation. And I'm going to tell you again, we don't need to go anywhere. The field is right here. We just have to be awake, awaken to the purpose of the kingdom. And I'll tell you one thing, too. As the kingdom moves forward, all hell breaks loose. The devil's not going to stir up too much stuff as long as you just do your nice little churchy things and stay in the building. But if you think about actually going out and advancing the kingdom, I'm going to come into your home and stir it up. I'm going to come into your church and stir it up. I'm going to come into your community and stir it up. We got lights that have been, I guess, blown out because um, Paul was telling me because people were upset that we did not allow people to use electricity for free. And um, yeah, it's going to get stirred up. But that's part of the kingdom. And so when Jesus gives this message, it, it, it just rings true. And the beautiful thing is, we, sometimes it's a little misunderstood, we think Jesus died on the cross so that we don't have to. Have you ever heard of that? 
Jesus, no, 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 that's not true. Jesus died on the cross so we could die with him. I'm going to say that again. Jesus died on the cross not so that we can go, you know, to Baskin Robbins. He died on the cross so that we can find the way to die with him and in so doing experience the resurrection with him. The resurrection power that dwells within us even now, even in this moment, even in every breath that I take, the resurrected Christ is within me, within you, within every one of his believers. And the devil will say, well, no, do, do, you, do you feel it? Is it? Well, it's not emotional. It's not nostalgic. It's not melancholy, sometimes melancholy. Ever experienced melancholy? We get that confused for spiritual um, motivation or spiritual reality. Melancholy is not spiritual reality. This is melancholy. But this living, breathing reality of God's spirit that dwells within us, this is what comes out of us. This is what is transforming us so that in the words of Paul, even though our outward human being is... Wasting away. You experience that? Getting older. Body's not uh, what it used to be. Couldn't even teach my Bible study on Monday because I um, had to take my first oscopy. As they were wheeling me away, the two nurses, I said, are you... Uh, you two the ones responsible for bringing me to the photo shoot? <laughs> they had to stop. I said, look, we've been doing this a long time. No one's ever said that before. <laughs> Body's getting older. Even though this is wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed. Inwardly we are entering into our destiny. That's why there is no death in Christ. Christ has destroyed death. This is what he's talking about. We don't spend near enough time talking about death. Jesus talks about it all the time. Unless a person dies, you can't come back and, or experience the kingdom, etc. So my friends in Christ, here we are in this season of Lent. <laughs> Which is a good reason to just eat as much corned beef as we can. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day like, lands right in Lent. Time of fasting. <laughs> But in this season of, of, of really meditating on the reality, not only of what Jesus did, but also what he is doing right now, because it's no different. It's no different. As we meditate on what he's doing now in our lives and collectively, may we remember that he and he alone is able to meet our deepest need to belong, to have meaning, to have purpose, and has called us as such to be a light to all those that are looking for it and may not find it, but they're still looking for it. They may not be aware of it, but they're still looking for it. And may the kingdom of God and the reality of that kingdom bless your lives so, so far beyond what we're able to imagine that you become obsessed with it and its beauty. Now and forever. Amen.